Welcome to season 2 of Concrete Conversations, the Indian real estate podcast. Our guest today is one of the most well-known names in the Indian real estate industry. He is a visionary and pioneer of new sectors, whether we're talking about townships, data centers, warehousing and logistics, education, or residential and commercial development. It is our pleasure to welcome to the podcast the brains behind one of India's first townships, the founder and managing director of the Hiranandani Group of Companies, and the national vice chairman of the leading real estate body Naredco, Dr. Niranjan Hiranandani. Dr. Hiranandani, with his wealth of experience, sheds light on sectors at the bleeding edge of this industry, and provides us with a bird's eye view of the present and future of real estate in India. So, without further ado, let's kick off season two. Dr. Hiranandani, thank you so much for taking the time to join us on Concrete Conversations. How are you feeling today? How is your day going so far? Akshay, it's a happy morning, and happy to uh, talk to you and uh, speak to you on this podcast. It's a pleasure uh, to be together, and I hope that we have a good morning. I'm sure we will. Thank you for that. Uh, you know, Dr. Hiran Nandani. Obviously, you are definitely a stalwart name in the real estate industry. But I thought if we could hear it from you personally, how did you uh, transition to real estate, and then how did you work towards where you are today in the in the industry? Well, I'm a first-generation businessman. Uh, my father was an eminent uh, ENT surgeon, Padma Bhushan, Dhanvantri Award winner, a great uh, social worker, and uh, lived a great life. And I came from a family of professional doctors. My elder brother being a doctor, my sister-in-law being a doctor. So everybody was a doctor. Uh, nobody in my family was in business before me. So I had a first-generation businessman in the entire family group. Uh, right. Having said that, we started with textiles and uh, uh, real estate in a small way. Ultimately, I had to sell off one of the businesses. It turned out to be selling the textile unit, and then uh, gone into real estate in a full-fledged way. And, right. Uh, now more than 45 years in the line, and. Uh, uh, hopefully, we have made our mark in the real estate field, and uh, and a lot of other things also as we have gone along. But real estate has been my forte, and uh, my life, my blood, my passion, my interest, my love. So all of it has been in the real estate business. Perfect. Uh, and sir, we know that you've been involved with uh, Naredco, which is the National Real Estate Development Council. You know, which is an industry body that represents the real estate industry to the government. But if we could hear from you, what exactly the role of Naredco is in real estate today, and uh, what kind of work you guys have been doing there? Well, I was part of the founding group of uh, Naredco, uh, which came up uh, with the Ministry of uh, Housing and Urban Affairs, Government of India. And the idea was to create a body which would uh, be able to nurture the future growth of real estate in India and actually to see that the government intervention would also be there in order to take it to the next level. So Naredco has done a fantastic job in the couple of years wherein the uh, different needs of the industry have been catered for and also the fact that the individual needs of the consumer have been taken care of. Right. The, the work on the Prime Minister Vas Yojana, which has now done more than 1.1 crore houses in the country, Naredko was with the Government of India for the purposes of formulating the policy, uh, which has achieved this in the last six years. And uh, really, we're still going strong and uh, the, pro the project still continues. Barring that, uh, we were also participating in various ways with the Government of India for the purposes of bringing in RERA, right. uh, the Real Estate Regulatory Act, and uh, a lot of discussions took place between Naredco and the Government of India, government and various governments and uh, parliamentary bodies before the Act of RERA was done. So all this and more has been done at the central government level. Hmm. Uh, also, land being a state subject, a lot of work is done at the state government level. So a lot of interaction has taken place between Naredco and the state government. For example, as you are aware, last year, uh, the, the, the uh, stamp duty was reduced by 60% uh, 
brought down from five uh, percent uh, to two percent, and then subsequently to three percent. Uh, this was also a proactive action between the state government and uh, Naredco, which participated in the role of convincing government that during COVID times, we needed to create and incentivize. This boosted uh, house buying, uh, created a economic uplift of the sector. It also brought about giving shelter to more and more people, made affordability in terms of housing, and all this and more has taken place. So Naredco has played a great role in terms of interaction with financial institutions, with the government of India, with the state governments, and of course, policy bodies. Uh, we have even done uh, conciliation forums wherein we have actually sat down with uh, the complaints which have come to the VERA authorities. And we have been able to do conciliation between the complainants and the developers uh, in terms of settlement of claims. And a good 60 to 70 percent of the claims which have been made by complainants against the developers have been sorted out uh, without having to require a judicial decision. Wow. And, and this and more. So lots, lots of it done by Naredco and of course the government. Right. Uh, and sir, I, I think it's absolutely fantastic what you were telling us right now about the conciliatory bodies. And since you touched upon Rera, I thought we could ask you about that next. Taking a, a bit of a step back in terms of the perspective for our listeners who may not be so um, involved personally with the real estate industry. Could you maybe shed light on some of the, the circumstances as an industry insider around why Naredco as a body looked at bringing Rera in? You know, builders were almost a dirty word and that people thought that they take undue advantage of the buyers. Uh, I think RERA is a law brought about a disclosure in terms of uh, accountability, a disclosure, a discipline, a transparency which was created between this. So a developer, when he takes up a project, is required to brief the, the, the customer through the re regulatory authority about the sizes of the tenements, the carpet area of it, the amenities that are going to be given, the time frame within which you can complete, we will complete the project. And if you didn't, they would be accountable to pay necessary penalties, which would be there. So a delay penalty was counted to be uh, the uh, interest rates charged by State Bank of India plus 2% and so on and so forth. So what has happened is that the, the buyer is now more confident to buy a, a project under construction, which would definitely benefit uh, uh, the, both the buyers and the sellers. Sellers, because of the transparency, there would be more confidence for the buyers to actually put in the money and therefore take the matters forward. So I think that's the you know uh, advantage which is there for the developers that a more transparency, discipline, and accountability is given. Right, and. Uh, as, as, as a bit of a follow-up here, um, uh, does Naredco have sort of a vision the, or the direction that one would like to see the real estate industry in India heading? Uh, certainly, Akshay. Uh, the, uh, uh, what, is, what is the objective, whether it's of the Prime Minister, whether it's the Housing Ministry or it is Naredco? It is housing for all. Right. It is uh, to achieve the shelter for all uh, in, in order to give affordable shelter for all. To see that those people who live in Jubi Jopris should actually get an apartment, get a house at affordable rates. And all this and more is the objective of Naretko. So uh, why is it that our country, which is now, uh, when you say needs roti kapra makan, you have roti and we are now even exporting rot, um, you know, wheat just now. Uh, we uh, Kapra we have for all. Uh, and for Makan, we have, uh, even in a city like Mumbai, we have more than 50% people still living in Jugi, Jopris or Jopatpattis. Right. Right. So the objective of Naredko and of course the government and the Prime Minister and the state government is very clear. How can we get affordable sex, uh, shelter for all and also to make it such that the industry stakeholders, banks, financial institutions, uh, other people who are invested both in the developers or giving housing loans to the buyers 
should also be protected under the circumstances right so then i think uh, this flows really well into another question we had thought of which is since you mentioned you know roti kapda makan as the fundamentals uh, what we think about in india affordable housing is something that's been gaining a lot of momentum but what do you feel is uh, needed for affordable housing to uh, grow a lot more in the next few years and where could we be going as in as a real estate industry with affordable housing uh lots of it the role is there going to be of the central government which is a policy maker right the role is of the state government which has to prepare land policies in terms of how uh, land issues are there done uh the role of the local authorities like corporations and others for giving approvals of it then also to see it make rational wherein the taxes today are so high on the issues whether it's stamp duty whether it's a uh, development charges whether it's other charges whether it's land under construction cost or other charges which are put are so heavy that uh, it's so factor the projects become unaffordable for the common man right so for example if you look at the ready rector rate it only just goes up 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 and up now right. you're going to do that on a continuing basis there's a challenge and uh, obviously you're not looking at bringing down the prices right now this is in conflict with what we want to achieve which is to bring affordability in the housing sector hmm but it's a beginning where we have made where we persuade and the first time the stamp duty did come down the ready rector unfortunately has now gone up uh, hmm. so all this is in conflict with what we really need in terms of it and that's where the role of uh, governments local authorities naretco individual developers and others becomes a very important part right and i think sticking to residential uh, another important theme that we've been seeing uh, was is townships and so since you've been a pioneer uh, in terms of townships with hiranandani gardens in pawai i wanted to ask you that since there is such a big need for housing and scalable housing for all as well do you think that townships will be a kind of a go to model in the future for large scale residential development in india yes and no yes for people who are far sighted no for people who look for quick returns right so by and large what has happened is everybody wants a quick return and uh, that cannot come into real estate in terms of the township project so we are long term players and we find that uh, going into townships is uh, been worth our while and uh, so we have sacrificed some of the profits in terms of putting investments into infrastructure to a great extent but it has brought about a great amount of satisfaction both to ourselves and our consumers so there are people who would never go to any other place but a hirnandani project and i think that satisfaction level is compensated for little lower profits that we have made over a period of time so we do see many players coming into the township model as we have done uh, but we think we are very happy that uh, you know we have done well in the township model and uh, we have given satisfaction so our townships would include residential look at commercial retail hospitals schools entertainment gardens all these things and more have been done in our township which we will continue to do and at least aspire to continue to do but you know it's not easy right right <laughs> you, you know dr hiran nandani one thing you talked about is the advent of being either a short term or a long term player and i like that you brought this up because it it raises a very interesting point of discussion if you look at more mature real estate markets especially those in the west you find that there are a lot of players with the long term philosophy and even when it comes to residential real estate you have what is a build and lease model where the developer holds the asset and leases it out instead of a build and sell model which you see very commonly in india well we are into the model uh, and we do a lot of leasing uh, and there are the developers who are into it like the rahichas and others who work on the le- leasing model and then raise the reit but uh, there are not too many doing class a uh, grade uh, uh, commercial properties of the size and scale that we do right so it's not that people don't do it but they don't do it in the size and scale that we are doing and some of the other large developers are doing in it right so that is definitely happening over a period of time and the asset class in terms of commercial has grown over a period of years though it has grown in uh, 
certain specific areas more than in other areas. So Bangalore, Hyderabad, Mumbai, NCR, will see much greater leadership in commercial IT space than other centers. Right. Even Pune has grown. So you do see some growth in certain areas, uh, but not in all. Right. Uh, so an interesting thing you mentioned there was uh, that, you know, there are some people who do a build and lease model and uh, try to convert these portfolios into a REIT, for example. So over the last few years, we've seen securitization and with the introduction of REITs and INVITs in India, we've also seen foreign investment coming in to maybe partner with developers here as well. So I wanted to ask you, how have these two things, do you feel, changed the development mindset or have they not impacted it that much? See, the requirements in the case of commercial is larger amount of capital. Uh, the, the, uh, the investor is more confident with certain developers to co-invest with them and be able to think that, believe that they are going to get that in rental space. Or there are people who will have a leased out model and then in order to encash their capital, would be able to convert it into a REIT or be transferred to them. And you have large companies and investors, FDI, foreign direct investors, Blackstone, Brookfield, uh, various other CPPIB and others who are putting in a huge, are uh, willing to put in, uh, you know, billions of dollars into this space, including the in which space of infrastructure. So we do see uh, co-investments taking place, but it's not uh, across the board. I mean, you, you, you will see that in uh, uh, certain locations, certain areas, certain cities and uh, grade A properties. Right. Right. Perfect. I think this uh, flows into another point that we would like to get your opinion on. For distributed commercial going forward, do you think something like high street retail is a little more viable given the situation we're in? <laughs> This is a COVID story. Uh, <laughs> you didn't talk of COVID, so it comes up over here. I think that, that was an inevitable question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what, is, what has happened is during the COVID times, all the governments, local authorities, corporations shut down all the malls. So everybody went into the high street retail. Right. So the, the, the high street retail model has again come back because people are petrified of the fact that tomorrow will the malls close again. So let's have some of the outlets in the high street model. So the high street, which was getting less importance over a period of time, has now spring back into importance. So we have a lot of people taking interest in the high street model also. So while the, the, the malls had literally, uh, you know, destroyed the high, high street retail on the high end uh, shop, uh, it's come back. So a lot of that has come back, but the malls have also returned. So it's now a mix of high street retail and the malls. Right. When we talk about uh, alternative asset classes within real estate, now we've talked about retail. There's also um, the emergence of new asset classes like warehousing, logistics, data centers, student housing, co-living, etc. So. Could you um, maybe shed some light for our listeners interested in any of these sectors in terms of what you think the future of these burgeoning sectors is going to be? Akshay, we are doing three out of these four. Right. right? <laughs> so we are doing warehousing uh, and logistics uh, on a platform called Greenbase along with Blackstone as a 50-50 enterprise. Right. Uh, we are also doing industrial housing in terms of uh, industrial platform, in terms of ind industry and uh, industrial parks. Uh, we also do co-housing in terms of industrial housing. We also put up the largest, uh, uh, Asia's uh, largest uh, tier four data center in uh, Panvel, Navi, Mumbai. Right. And uh, we do student housing to a very small extent, but we are covering all this in the Hiran and Lani's downstream. Data center, of course, is led by a company called Yota. Right. And uh, that's doing it extremely well and we are putting up the second uh, large data center in the NCR region. Right. Uh, Dr. Hiranandani, do you feel, um, I mean, is it okay for us to ask you which you think is the most exciting sector? <laughs> <laughs> uh, today, uh, the fastest growing is uh, data centers followed by warehousing and industrial and then followed by student housing. But this can change anytime. Right. Uh, you know, as uh, 
make in india grows the uh, warehousing and uh, and covid position the warehousing was growing faster today it is data center you ask me after three months it is again changed right so they are all growing very fast they are all rapid growth industry and uh, difficult to say who is uh, doing it uh, but the growth story in these segments is extremely high in the next couple of years and uh, that's why we are focused into these spaces right just as a quick follow up to that uh, you said that you know the development of some of these new sectors is maybe limited to certain markets sometimes for, and especially for for something like hyperscale data centers for example there would be limitations on where these could be put up so do you feel that uh, there are certain markets where these new verticals will be tried out and maybe the wrinkles will be ironed out before we see it spread to the like you know more places in india so data centers is a very specialized business right and there are there is there are two types of people who participate in data centers the first are those people who construct the buildings for data centers and then lease it out or sell it the second is those people who build it and operate data centers so we are doing the first and the second 90% of the developers or i think almost everybody of the developers is only doing the first part which is building buildings for data centers and then leasing it out or selling it we we are in both the businesses so that's the difference between us and the other real estate players who are in two data centers understood so we do a lot differently when we talk about logistics we also Uh, give lot of services in that sector when we do warehousing also we run lot of logistics right and uh, so uh, we we run uh, for example when you talk about student housing uh, i run 14 colleges i run six schools so we have more than 45000 students in colleges 15 16000 students in schools so obviously it's not just student housing housing that we are talking about it's an education system and now i also run a university right so when you talk about when you talk about these sectors we are not only purely looking at it as a real estate business we are also looking at the education sector in a very 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 big way right right and uh, uh, dr hiran anani we're glad you brought up education because that's one of the things that in fact you know when we talk about real estate and education in real estate that's one of the 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 gaps that inspired us to start this podcast um and we know that you also run uh the niranjan hiran anani school of real estate under hsnc university uh in mumbai so we thought uh we could ask you about that which is uh what was the inspiration uh for developing that program and and what do you think the the course is designed to do and where do you what do you hope the people who attend that course get out from it so i run a lot of education courses and others in the city of mumbai and the neighborhood and uh, when we were talking and discussing in the new university one of the things that was pointed out by industry is that we don't have many courses in india which actually uh, seeks to train people for the real estate business or industry so for example let's look at marketing mm-hmm. uh, you get lot of degrees of people who have done marketing in their the colleges and the graduation that they do but none of the schools of marketing train the students for real estate industry right so they are general marketing and they do for retail they do for other things but they don't do for real estate uh if you look at finance uh, you do a mba in finance but you don't get a focus on finance in real estate right so uh, so you never get students who are young bright students who actually are trained and groomed in the real estate business and hence uh, at the board level uh, i was uh, encouraged to say that why can't i not start some something which is a uh, mba in real estate hmm. uh, which would train people in all these subjects and bring bright young uh, girls and boys to actually enter the industry with a complete degree which is uh, a masters of business mba with a focus on real estate and i think uh, we are doing that and that is how the emergence of the school of real estate that was done uh, we also have certificate courses that we conduct and now the next generation of uh, narepco 
uh, wanting special courses to be created by us at the university in order to train these people or actually uptrain these people because they are already very knowledgeable uh, to go into for retraining, uptraining into all the new nuances of technology, of new ideas and thoughts in the real estate trade. Right. Perfect. And uh, honestly, I think that both of us can uh, attest to the fact that one of the most uh, common questions that we've been getting on social media from our listeners also is uh, this curiosity about real estate courses and real estate education. Yeah. Because there is uh, a much more interest in real estate as a career option for young people, I feel today. Absolutely. And uh, moving on to a more, uh, you know, future facing question, I wanted to ask you about uh, sustainability and climate change in the real estate industry and we, we've spoken about housing for all today and the volume of housing that we're going to need over the next decade for everyone in india which obviously will have uh, implications you know in terms of emissions and everything as well so what can the real estate industry do and maybe what steps are they taking right now to work towards maybe uh, attain, attaining carbon neutral goals or uh, self-sustainability in real estate okay so let me show off a little bit yash <laughs> uh, uh, if I may. Yeah, of course. Uh, in Pawai, Hiranatani Gardens, last 30 years, we recycle 4 million litres of sewerage every day and reuse that water. Wow. wow. The whole city of Mumbai doesn't just, uh, recycle, the municipal corporation doesn't recycle to the extent we do even 8 million litres. They don't do the whole city and we do 4 million litres and we do 4 million litres in Hiranatani estate in Thani. Right. Number two, we, we have, when I took over the, uh, the land in Pawai, we had 20 trees in 250 acres. Hmm. Now we have 4 lakh trees which are more than 40 feet tall and we have nearly 40 acres, 50 acres of gardens and forests. Wow. And the water table around the area has gone up because of the uh, rainwater harvesting and other things that we have done. So we have already proved ourselves in the last 30 years that development and environment can be sustainable and we can actually improve the environment and the climate change by doing development which is environmentally friendly. And we have done it over a period of 30, 35 years. So we've given, in fact, the best example of sustainability uh, in the whole country or maybe any part of the world. So all that and more, uh, you know, solid waste management and all the other things also we have been continuing to do. Uh, we use uh, the recycled water for flushing uh, and all the other aspects of it. We have platinum rated buildings which use less energy. Right. So all these and more we continue to do in terms of sustainability measures for our company. And obviously the industry is now picking up and we are seeing more and more of that by the whole industry as a whole. It's taking time, but the industry has learned that it is beneficial to do so. And the good developers are definitely into it. Right. And so, uh, maybe a, a question that's a little uh, closer to home for Akshay and I and perhaps for you as well. We've been seeing so much change in uh, Mumbai recently with uh, so many projects in terms of, uh, you know, whether it's the Trans Harbour Link or the Coastal Road or, or all the metros that we're seeing. So if I could just get your opinion on the future of real estate growth in Mumbai, where, where do you think the uh, development action is, to, is going to be over the next decade? So... Uh, you know, uh, the, the, the type of infrastructure you talked about, we are building in the Mumbai region 300 kilometers of metro. Right. We are building the Cross Harbour Bridge of 22 kilometers, which is the largest, uh, longest bridge over the ocean in India. Right. Or probably in Asia. And uh, we are uh, building the uh, coastal road on the uh, uh, western side. We are also having the Navi Mumbai Airport which is coming up. So all this is almost an investment of almost 3 lakh crores, which is being invested in the Mumbai region. Right. Now, 3 lakh crores, just to give you a number crunch, in the last 60 years of India in the MMR region, the investment by center and state government was 30,000 crores. 
and in the next five years, we are in, in the last three years and next three years, we'll be investing three lakh crores. And I'm not talking about the bullet train from Ahmedabad to Mumbai. And I'm not talking about the 80,000 crores of uh, road from Nagpur to Mumbai. Right. So if you look at that, the infrastructure is certain. Right. Earlier, what used to happen, buildings used to come first and development would come up later on. Today, that fortunately, they are trying to compensate for the lack of infrastructure in the region. So I think development in the Mumbai region is definitely going to grow over the next couple of years. And I see that as a positive direction. So I think uh, we are really grateful to the governments which, of the day who have actually initiated this infrastructure and now building it with good vigor and trying to do it. The Cross Harbour Bridge will open up enough land on Panwit to culture equivalent to half the land of Mumbai, which is vacant. Right. So there's a lot of possibility of development in the next couple of years, which will be quality development across the mainland. Right. And I think uh, Dr. Hiran Andani, that opens the road to our final question, so to speak. And we've talked, we've covered a huge breadth and depth of, of topics and subsectors within real estate in this conversation with you. Um, as we look ahead to the, the next financial year, which is the year 2022-2023, we thought we could get your opinion on what are the subsectors or the new trends that maybe people out there who are interested in real estate should look out for? I think uh, the future is very, very bright because uh, irrespective of uh, COVID and the Ukraine-Russian uh, war, uh, one thing is certain, the growth of India, even though it's brought down to 8%, is still higher than most of the other countries in the entire world. Right. So the opportunity of growth is definitely there. Yes, we are challenged with the price of oil and other cost of materials going up. So there is a challenge in terms of a little downturn in the uh, overall GDP growth. But employment potential looks like growing fast. Remember, we are making 35 kilometers of national highways per day. Right. So the employment potential in that sector is growing. Uh, we are now exporting to uh, various countries for food. Uh, we are exporting vaccines. Now we are going to make uh, mobile phones. We are looking at export of cars and e-vehicles. So all this and more gives a bright story of the growth of India and obviously the growth of income levels uh, and of course, we are challenged because, you know, countries next to us are also growing. But growth is definitely there, whether it's real estate or other sectors. So the future looks good, according to me. Uh, and I think India will be really brighter than it has been yesterday. Perfect. I think that's a lovely and positive note to wrap this conversation on as well. Dr. Hiranandani, thank you so much for your time and uh, for sharing your knowledge and your opinions with us today. I'm sure our listeners will be very thrilled to listen to this conversation. I do hope that you've carried away some learnings and uh, I have tried to share the best I could. Thank you. If you enjoyed this conversation, be sure to follow Concrete Conversations on Instagram to know more about upcoming episodes and for some behind-the-scenes content. For more deep dives into the world of Indian real estate, stay tuned for more Concrete Conversations. Yeah, 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 yeah.